Well, hey guys, it's Josh KI6NAZ. Last Saturday, I did a live stream on breaking down acronyms, ham radio acronyms on my Saturday live show. After the live show, I went in and edited out some of the beginning little clips where my kids came into the live stream and I had to kind of cut that out because they were not having any of listening to daddy on that night. Well, while I was editing it, I was using the YouTube editor. I snipped those pieces out and while it snipped the video, it didn't snip the audio, so everything was all out of whack. I had to pull the video down, edit it locally, and I've re-uploaded it. And I've re-uploaded it with just the body of the talk. So if you like that kind of stuff and you want to just get right to the meat, this is the video for you if you're interested in ham radio acronyms. Anyway, let's get started. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you watch live, thanks so much for doing so. Thanks. We are talking about demystifying ham radio acronyms. This is a, a topic that comes up a lot. People are always asking, hey, can we, can you do a video on just explaining some of these acronyms? Because some of them can be uh, confusing or, you know, maybe there there's a history there in some cases that we don't understand. So, you know, this is hopefully going to answer some of those questions and it'll be a good video later on the back end that people might come around and actually take a look at it and, and help them out when it comes to learning some of these acronyms. Technical hobbies demand acronyms to make time speaking about them more efficient. We use acronyms to take larger terms and break them down to just the chunk that you need for reasons like imagine how long it would take to take a simple point if we had to spell it all out. It would take forever. But we do need to explain them, and so hopefully that's what this is going to do. And I have to get this kid out of here. <laughs> Okay. Nintendo Switch, man. <laughs> okay. So general terms. We're going to start off slow and then build up. Yeah, the kids are lids. <laughs> Daddy fixed the Switch. Literally, we've been playing around with that thing for the last two hours. I told them it has to charge, and they keep taking it off of the charger, putting it back, taking it off, putting it back. So I apologize. I need a sip of beer. It's, uh... Rich, our Rich says, hey, Josh, put your little ham on live stream. Maybe that will tire them out. It's two, and they're upset about <laughs> completely unrelated things. So general terms. We'll start off small, and we'll build our way up. RF is radio frequency. So if I'm referring to RF or I'm saying uh, radio frequency or RF radiation, stuff like that, that's where you would use that term. SWL is a shortwave listener, not necessarily an amateur radio operator, but somebody who listens to shortwave radios. Uh, an OP is an operator. Now, HAM. Ah. HAM gets used as an acronym a lot. Some people think that it should be all capitalized. It's not. It is just HAM. It's like um, capital H if you're using it in the front of a sentence or part of a title. But it is not an acronym of any kind. With that said, there are people who are way too serious about using it as an acronym when people use it as an acronym shouldn't be at all some will chastise you for having using it you having used it like that just tell them to lighten up it, it, have fun you know you can listen to what they're saying because it is actually not an acronym but you know that's just an fyi for some of you that's a little new i'm sure i missed i'm sure i missed some acronyms in this entire thing there are thousands there's probably literally thousands of acronyms that are ham related but here's a good set at least what i think are important and that some of you should know so breaking things down Let's just start with HTs. There's a ton of acronyms just on the face of a Baofeng here. By the way, HT stands for Handy Talkie, and that goes back towards um, the Motorola days of World War II when, you know, when they had this big, huge phone thing that they would carry around. The first handhelds were called Handy Talkies. We still use the term HT, but largely it just means handheld. Okay, we're also going to talk about mobile radios, base station radios, HF antennas, propagation terms. There's a litany of things that we're going to cover. So let's keep it easy for those starting out with handheld. If your radio has a V or a VFO in the front of it, and by the way, some of these terms are going to be universal for whether it's a mobile radio or an HF radio base station, you name it. VFO is a variable frequency oscillator. 
its job is to uh, change the frequency, which allows you to move up and down the band that you're operating in. HTs have this, mobile radios have this, HF radios have it. Sometimes there is an M or an MR button, which is a memory, memory record, or memory channel. Sometimes, if you have a frequency you like, or you're trying to load like a repeater, you might key in the VFO to a certain frequency or use the keypad to type it in, add a PL tone, which we'll talk about that. You'll use an offset for frequency and then save it to a memory channel. That way, once you load up all these memory channels, you can quickly cycle through them. TXP or TXPWR is transmit power. Literally, the wattage that your radio is putting out to make a contact. And that's universal. That could be something that's going to be on a HT or on a mobile or HF radio. Uh, SQL is squelch. And squelch is basically the noise threshold. When a signal comes in, if it's higher than the squelch limit, the squelch will open, your speaker will turn on from a from a functional standpoint and you'll be able to hear the signals coming in tdr is dual watch or sometimes it's dr dual watch is when you have a radio that allows two input streams or two either two independent receivers that can be receive on two frequencies at the same time or one radio that has the ability to kind of monitor both and switch between them really quickly. And then when the first one comes in with a signal, it'll favor that one until the signal stops and then go back to switching very quickly, listening. So that's generally what dual watch is. So for handhelds continued, CTCS, if you've ever heard of that, that is continuous tone coded squelch. And that is what repeaters use to like a reverse squelch, instead of it just being give me any signal and I'll open the squelch and let you let you talk through the repeater, be amplified in our antennas and, and transmit wherever it goes. Um, you use this to send in a sub-audible tone from your radio. That tone is received by the repeater. The repeater goes, ah, oh, that's the frequency I'm supposed to be listening to or the hertz signal, and boom, it opens the squelch and you're able to hear. Digital coded squelch is kind of similar from a working standpoint. It allows the radio to tune out certain signals that you didn't really want to listen to or tone out. PTT is push to talk. It's the button on the side of the radio. BCL is busy channel lockout. And that basically prevents the radio from transmitting when it knows there is a strong signal already transmitting. Oh, did I skip Vox? I skipped Vox. Voice operated switch. You, instead of having to PTT, you can just talk and it turns the radio on and transmit. Sorry about that. Thanks for mentioning it in the chat. Uh, BCL, I mentioned that channel lockout. So basically what that means is you're not going to step on somebody. Have you ever experienced when you're on a repeater and two people are talking at the same time? You'll hear one major station, one major station that is taking kind of ownership, uh, and they call that the capture effect of the repeater. They're transmitting into the repeater. They've got the bigger system or bigger signal, but then there's somebody else underneath it. And you kind of hear a kind of noise. A BCL would basically have your radio not be able to transmit if there was somebody that was keyed up at the same time as you. Uh, but that's not at the same time. Like if you keyed up at the exact same time, it, it makes it difficult. Um, also, some of them are, are less nuanced than that, and it doesn't allow them to actually... Uh, know what your offset is. So this can be hit or miss. Sometimes it's not worth the effort. FMW, which you're going to see on Yesu radios, stands for Function Memory Write. This is a multifunction button that is for writing channels and for getting into like the, mem the menu system, a bit deeper in the menu system. BCN TX can sometimes mean beacon transmit. BCN is generally the beacon portion of that. You'll see that on some radios, particularly those that run APRS. All right, so mobile radios, again, a lot of these terms are, are the same, but I do have mobile radios, and sometimes they have different buttons on them. Case in point, this is a 2730. A Yaesu 27, sorry, ICOM 2730. And it has a Moni button, and then underneath that it says dupe. Well, so what does that mean? Moni generally means monitor. And you can see that on Baofengs, other HTs. What it is is when you click it, it will remove the squelch 
or whatever you have on the radio as far as controlling the audio output, and you will be able to hear just unadulterated RF, what's, what's coming into the radio for whatever mode you're running in. Uh, when you have it in dupe, that's duplex, and specifically that generally means the crossband repeat capability where you transmit in with VHF, and that's an acronym we'll get to, and it transmits out on UHF. That's a duplex functionality. Here's another mobile radio. This is a Yaesu FTM 400. It has a series of buttons as well, like one there it says D and X. This is digital, or in this case, wires X. Digital is another term set we'll talk about in a bit, but there's usually a, a button on these different types of digital radios that will take it out of frequency modulation, FM mode, and put it into a digital mode. Usually each brand has their own digital mode that they work off of, and so this is the Yesu one. It's the D and the X, which allows you to change into the digital mode or push it into a wires X control. Paul Garber, thank you for the super chat, says, Leia will feel better. She's making spike proteins the worse the reaction, the better the protection. Still alive from NJ, New Jersey, W2RIF. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Paul. Display, in the case of, of again, Yesu radios, some radios also have a DISP, is basically a control to change the look of the main screen. So this is a digital display. It's an LCD panel. If you click that display button, it'll cycle through looking at your GPS information, where you're currently located, or what GPS signals you're picking up. There's a myriad of things attached to it, but it is an acronym just so, well, kind of an acronym or an abbreviation. DR for D-Star radios stands for Digital Repeater, or D-Star Repeater Mode. This is seen on pretty much all the ICOMs that run D-Star, but this also includes, um, nowadays with the 705, the ability to use this for analog repeaters. In fact, one of the best ways to do memory programming on the IC705, the ICOM IC705, is to use this DR control mode, this DR mode. All right, jumping into HF radios. A lot of different terms here with the HF, and we're going to start expanding this a bit into more information about bands and modes of operation and that kind of stuff. But we'll start out with the physical box. Sometimes it's easiest if you just understand the physical box, then you can build upon that. So AGC is automatic gain control, and you can't see it. You can. Uh, nope, I've got the wrong screen on to show you AGC. Bummer. So AGC, automatic gain control, adjusts the device to keep Basically, it's a device that keeps the audio levels constant. If you are doing digital modes, you want a fast on-off cycle. You want the AGC to drop immediately after the signal drops so your computer isn't taking in more information and trying to, uh, trying to process it. ATT often stands for attenuator, and that's there to basically attenuate, knock down a large signal that prevents basically receiver overloading. Oftentimes, people refer to a receiver as a front end of a radio. It's the, sig it's the first stop for the signals to come in, so it's often referred to as the front end. If you apply an attenuator, it will keep that front end from overloading. This is often seen on some of the lower bands I've experienced, uh, where you have like a big boom in signal on 40 meters. Throw the attenuator on it, level that out a little bit, and you stop getting that overload, which some of you may experience on 40 meters on the 7300, for instance, can get overloaded. I've seen that happen before in case of very, very large loud signals. So HF radios continued. TXCO, Temperature Compensated Crystal Oscillator. If you have a radio that, that has this or calls that out, it's generally a way to prevent the radio from randomly drifting as it l does not have a good stable time source. Time sources allow the radio to keep its frequency without drifting. And sometimes you won't know it's drifting. It would be seen on those that are receiving your signals. You'll appear off of the main frequency that you've actually tuned up on your radio. This happens a lot on some of the older radios that are that haven't warmed up yet. Oh, Leia's up. <laughs> I'm glad Leia's awake. <laughs> She's been out a, a little while. So that's good to see her <laughs> in the chat. So a TXCO is something that's valuable for keeping a time source. A lot of times now, they 
for some of these SDR radios, they'll actually use GPS signal as a time source, which can be helpful too. RIT stands for Receive Independent Tuning. What this does is accommodate or account for drift that some of these older radios can have. How this is used? When you're on a, a center, you know, a frequency where you, you believe the QSO is happening, this call that's happening, and let's say that's, that station starts to kind of like drift a couple of hertz, uh, kilohertz off of you. Well, you can use RIT to move the receiver down, but not move your transmit down. And that allows you to keep having a QSO without having to, to move your radio because that would change your transmit frequency, which they might not be able to, to hear, to follow along. All right, so the big stuff. Now we're getting into a, some of the more nitty gritty. Radio bands and propagation acronyms. Tons of acronyms here. HZ is Hertz, which is cycles per second. So many Hertz is the cycles per second we use. And that can be represented by stacking, you know, 10 to the power of three is kilohertz, and then megahertz, and then gigahertz. So at a certain point, we stop talking Hertz. For HF radio, we talk you know, um, kilohertz and megahertz, and then all the way up until you get to VHF, UHF, when you start to get into the gigahertz space, which is yeah, right there. So long wave, LW, is all frequency, the frequency space. Now we're talking about the, the radio frequency spectrum, okay, not to get too confusing there, but zero to 300 kilohertz is considered long wave. This is lower than shortwave or HF amateur radio. It's below that point. Medium wave is considered 530 through 1700 kilohertz, which is represented by MW. That is where you will find AM broadcast stations, medium wave. Shortwave comes in, now you're getting higher frequency. Shortwave comes in, SW, from the 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz space. And I will say that this is, uh, there's a bit of adjustment and, and a bit of sliding up and down because amateurs do have access to lower bands, lower than 3 megahertz of operation. We have 160, I'm sorry, 160 is the 3 megahertz space. We got a new one, it's 2200, I think, 2200 or um, 20. 2300 can't remember exactly but it's lower than three megahertz so that would go beyond the shortwave space now hf which i've been using that term a lot stands for high frequency and that is generally but there are the exceptions i just gave encompassed by the shortwave radio space so all the shortwave spaces are three to 30 megahertz that takes you from 160 meters all the way up to 10 meters then you start getting into the VHF space, which is where six meters comes into play. And then VHF two meter band, and then you go to 70 centimeters, which is a part of the UHF ultra frequency. And again, those go from VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz. UHF ultra high frequency is 300 megahertz to three gigahertz. And then super high frequency is three gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. Now there is another step. There's actually a couple more steps. There's EHF after that, which is extremely high frequency and so on and so forth until you start ionizing your body with radiation. And we don't play into that space in the amateur radio world. Propagation terms. Who, who thought I would mention the muff? Uh, dear podcast listeners that are, that are watching me right now. The muff is the maximum usable frequency. What do we use this for? Well, you're looking at a picture of a muff chart. The muff chart shows us where between two points of whatever, wherever you want to make a QSO. Let's say you're, you know, I'm in California, I'm in Cerritos, California, and I want to talk to somebody in Maine. Well, if you can see, there's a, a horizontal kind of bar, you know, a horizontal strip that kind of goes along the country, and there's a 14 there in the middle. The MUF, the maximum usable frequency, is 14 megahertz for communication between Cerritos, California, and Maine. If I wanted to talk to South America, well, we actually cross through a couple of different MUFs. It would be, it could be 14 meters, it could up, be all the way up to 30 meters. And so you, you do have a little bit of space to play with. I did capture this earlier today, and, and the bands are kind of meh. Joe Cup, thank you for the $7.62, my favorite super chat, for something to help Leia feel better. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Joe Cup. 
She is in the chat, though. So thank you, Leia, for coming on out. The lowest usable frequency is the distance between two points, the lowest frequency that's possible for making a QSO. And then the SFI is the solar flux index, and it's the amount of solar spots on the Earth-facing sun. So we actually, you know, move around the sun, the sides of the sun that we see will change, and the solar sun, the solar spots, sunspots we see are calculated, and the value we're given is the solar flux index. This map is a fantastic map. It's available at prop.kc2g.com. Great, um, really, really good uh, page there. So go check that out. You can leave this up on your, your page. In fact, let's see what the time has gone by. I think that we have a change in the frequency space. Where is it? Did I lose it? Where did my muff chart go? <laughs> I'll pull it up right now because I'm actually curious what what has changed in yeah so we've got a totally different view let, let me show you what this looks like that's the wrong one. Oh, that's the wrong one there it is so that's the the muff now you can see that the the higher frequency that was over South America, the higher frequency 30 meters 30 megahertz that type of stuff has started to move uh, to the east or to the west, depending on how you look at it, as the, the day-night cycle is passing overhead. So they're losing the higher frequencies as that you know mound there in the middle, which is the night cycle, day-night cycle is coming overhead. So you start to lose that as it goes over. Hopefully that was helpful. And where'd the chat go? There it is. Okay. There's sound. Refresh. Refresh your screen. Okay. So let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about radio modes. So we've mentioned radio functions on the radio, uh, different frequencies, different types of, of propagation information. Now we'll talk about the modes that you will then apply your RF to, uh, to then make contacts on those different bands, that different band space. CW is continuous wave, which is the mode that we use to transmit Morse code. CW isn't Morse code. It is generally just a, you know, 500 kilohertz wide or hertz wide sine wave of, of sound of like 700 hertz, the, the sound, the audio sound for that sine wave. And you're just keying it on and off. That keying on and off is what allows you to transmit uh, CW, Morse code. Uh, see, I just did it. Allows you to transmit Morse code. So you use Morse code to transmit. <laughs> I'm killing myself. You use CW, the mode on your radio, to transmit Morse code. There, I got it. It's a, it's a subtle distinction, but it, it's worth knowing so that y you can handle, you know, when people start using it in different ways. Uh, okay, AM is amplitude modulation which is a voice mode i just i add distinction here for these voice modes this is pretty much the first voice mode it's still in use for broadcast radio stations today we mentioned that it exists down in the medium wave portion of the radio spectrum you'll hear ssb a lot ssb is single sideband there are two sidebands there is an upper and a lower sideband this is a voice mode that is predominantly used in HF radio. It's what you know, most of the contacts are made on voice these days. And how it is done is you take AM. AM has a carrier right in the middle and two side lobes or side bands. And you just cut out the, the carrier frequency or cut out the carrier in the middle and one of the side bands leaving either the upper or the lower. And then you just focus all your RF into that. It makes for more efficient communications or a better use of power However, the fidelity of that signal is somewhat repressed as you're not sending out more of the fidelity that is a part of the AM transmission. So FM is frequency modulation, which is another voice mode. It's very popular with VHF, UHF radios. In fact, local broadcast stations are somewhere in that VHF space. It provides high fidelity sound because it is a frequency modulation instead of an amplitude modulation signal. That came later, too. That was uh, introduced or developed later, much um, in the 30s, I believe, than AM. 
radio modes continued. So now we'll talk about some of the digital modes. You, you're probably familiar with digital modes if you're getting into amateur radio. VHF, UHF radios, often there's many digital flavors of those radios. One of them is D-Star, which is a digital smart technologies for ham radio. What is that? You key up the radio, you talk into it, that microphone has an analog signal that takes your voice, turns it into analog signal. That analog signal gets converted into a digital format. So you can think ones and zeros, that kind of thing. And then there's multiple form factors that are applied at that point before it hits the radio and transmits over RF. On the other side, the radio signals are received. It gets uh, basically demodulated or decoded, not de-encoded. There's multiple terms for that. No, it's not encrypted. It's encoded in this digital mode. It gets decoded back into digital voice and then back to something that represents an analog voice that gets spit out into the speakers. DMR is a similar mode. It stands for digital mobile radio. It is a digital voice and data mode used by numerous companies. DMR is a it originated in business radio, so it predates that of amateur radio. It wasn't designed for amateur radio specifically. But, you know, like all things, Hams thought it was a good idea if we co-opted that, brought it into the fold, and that became the DMR that you see today on different radios. Multiple Chinese radios uh, operate within DMR because it's a it's easy for them to create radios in that space. I think that it's all open source. I could be wrong. I I think that's not true. But anyway, I don't I, I didn't prepare any of that information. This is just supposed to be acronym descriptions. TDMA is time division multiple access. So what this does, a repeater, for instance, using this would allow multiple channels to exist within the same frequency space that is either allocated to them for use based off of the radio service they're on or would be like the same frequency space that analog FM radio would exist on. You can actually have multiple um, time channels, logical time channels, that you have multiple uh, discussions going on at one time, which is nice. That's one of the values of digital modes is that you can split it up. C4FM is continuous four-level frequency modulation. This is the digital voice standard that is used by Yesu, for instance. All right. So let's hit some antennas and shack items. So we've talked about radios. We've talked about frequency spaces, modes of operation, including digital modes. Now let's hit some antennas. All right. Antenna items or terms. Coax, not really an acronym, but I mention it. It's coaxial cable. It's the ham radio feed line that is most often used. Not all the time, but most often. You will hear the term UHF connector. I mention it because, again, it's not, it's kind of an acronym. It's a hodgepodge term referring to a period in time where it meant anything, a connector used for over 30 megahertz. That's not really the case anymore. We use it for HF radio, and we use it into uh, VHF space. In fact, it, it goes over 100 uh, megahertz. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's also referred to as PL259 and SO239. The PL stands for the plug, and the SO stands for the socket. And that's referring to the center pin, the center connector of that, of that connector. Now, generally, 100 megahertz is what people use this for, but obviously, I'm using it in my car for VHF, UHF. So there's different qualities of connectors. Most of the stuff that's available for ham radio can take you up into VHF, UHF without any problem. With that said, another connector you may be referring or have seen or own or have heard of is BNC, and that is the Bayonet Neil Konselman. And I'm sure I mispronounced that. I apologize. This is a twist lock antenna connector. It's most often seen in portable radios, like my ICOM 705 features a BNC connector. It is reliable for signals up to two gigahertz. And what happens, I actually found this really interesting when I was researching this a while back. What happens is when you start going beyond two gigahertz, the slots on the BNC actually start um, it starts either arcing or resonating or it becomes part of the antenna. It, it causes all kinds of problems. I found that fascinating because that's one of my favorite parts about um, the, the twist lock connector is that it's really simple. Wherever you're at, you can just bam, bam, easy. You don't have to worry about keying the threads or possibly cross-threading, although that's 
pretty um, pretty difficult to do with UHF connectors, but I thought that was really cool. So the SMA connector, the tiny little gold goldish copper colored connector, sub miniature version A. Okay, that's what that stands for. That's capable of zero hertz through 40 gigahertz. Fantastic connector. Often used when you start to get into higher frequency um, type radios. I know that a lot of uh, test equipment uses SMA. A lot of stuff I use at work uh, uses SMA. Usually requires a torque wrench though to get the best capability out of it. Type N. Type N is similar to a UHF connector that was invented in the 40s by Paul Neal, and it's capable of frequencies up to 10 gigahertz. People love it for VHF, UHF, highly recommended. K6LW, and everybody who's saying, what about, what about, what about, I'm not even through the slide package yet. Just, just wait. <laughs> just wait. At the end, if I don't mention your, your favorite acronym, Mention it at the end. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it to the chat, and you guys can throw me your best acronyms, and we can talk about it. Did I skip? Oh, is that what you're saying? Did I skip TNC? Did I skip TNC? No, I didn't. I did put it in here, though. No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, see? You make me screw up. <laughs> okay, where was I? Right here. All right, SWR. We mention it all the time. I mention it all the time. It stands for Standing Wave Ratio. It is the measured difference between the impedance of your antenna connector and the antenna feed line connection, or the, the antenna. And it's measured in one to one would be a perfect match. Two to one is, you know, starting to drift away. Three to one is getting to the point where your radio is not going to be happy. And pretty much anything after that point, you either need to adjust your feed line somehow or physically adjust the antenna, do something to bring that match back in. And your radio is looking for generally 50 ohms of impedance. That is HF radios, handhelds, mobiles, generally all 50 ohms of impedance. So getting this correct is something that a lot of hams strive for. We try to bring our SWR, our, software, our standing wave ratio, down to the lowest level that we possibly can. And we really think that's a good idea. And sometimes for using coax feed lines, it is. Now, here's, this is, we could spend a lot of time on this. In fact, <laughs> W2CMP New Jersey uh, sends a super chat, confident that you'll cover snafu and foobar. I don't think I will because I think those terms go beyond just amateur radio. But you could look those up and those are great terms. I have a... Uh, uh, I have uh, done, I have used that term a lot at work. Snafu in particular. <laughs> um, okay, so transmatch and ATU, th these next sub bullets are related to each other. Transmatch is a transmission line matching unit. And then there is an ATU, antenna tuning unit. And there are a myriad other devices that have clever acronyms that refer to something that is either in the radio or external to the radio, but in the RF processing chain, it goes antenna, some kind of ATU or transmatch, and then the radio, your receiver. What these devices do is try and create an impedance that your radio will be happy with. It doesn't, as we've talked about in the past, it doesn't change the antenna in any way, but it does try and get in front of the mismatch that may exist in the impedance of the antenna and the radio. Now. I know in I know there are people that draw a distinction between transmatches and antenna tuners, ATUs, and, and the capabilities therein. And there are nuances at play here. Many will argue a transmatch's job is to simply make the radio happy and move on, move on to other things. A lot of QRP radios have an internal tuning unit. They're referred to as ATUs, they're they're also transmatches. However, the flip side of this is there are tuners that are external that you put right by the antenna and you plug a random wire into it. Those tuners are more broadbanded in their capability of what they can match. They are more a part of the antenna system than they are simply to fix the ohms of impedance of the antenna going into your radio. So there are different antenna uh, ATUs, transmatch systems. There's all kinds of different stuff like that. There are different qualities. You pay more for really good ones that are really wide-banded, that have amazing capabilities, and sometimes the ones that come in radios are, are not that great. 
that is a, a video that could be its own thing. I should actually have experts that actually know this stuff come on and talk more about it because I have definitely had, I don't know, four or five ATUs that, that either are external or go in a radio or whatever, and they all behave a little bit differently. Some are more for QRP radios. There's an acronym we'll talk about. QRP radios, some are just there for handling the wattage that I'm putting out of my amplifier. But they, they are different, and they have different capabilities, and they're obviously built differently as well. Racer X07 sends a super chat. Passed general, ch passed my general test and waiting on my radio equipment. All 30 plus days away. Bad time to start a new hobby, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Keep up the great work. Be on the air soon, I hope. Yes, it's a quite an interesting time. There are shortages of radios, specific radios. We've talked about that on the live stream in the news segments. It probably deserves a bit of a talk on its own to discuss what's going on there. So we'll be we'll be talking about that hopefully in the future. All right. Bal uns and I capitalized some letters to make it a little bit easier. Bal uns and un uns. Balanced to unbalanced. Unbalanced to unbalanced. Those are antenna pieces. Generally they are at the feed point of the antenna or they are the feed point of the antenna. And it is for attaching coax to either a balanced or unbalanced antenna system. I did a deep dive on a lot of antenna terms and definitions. You can find it on my channel. Or you can just probably search for ham radio antenna terms on YouTube and you'll probably find it. I do recommend you go check that out because uh, there was drawings and all kinds of fun stuff as we explain what was going on. Antennas continued. More acronyms. NVIS, Near Vertical Incidence Skywave. That is an HF antenna. This is a specific antenna, or at least a, a deployment of an antenna that is unique. It's an HF, high frequency, antenna that's generally 7 meters and lower, so down into the 80 meter space, 160, etc., and is lower to the ground and oriented horizontal to the ground. And that basically makes more of the RF go vertically into the atmosphere and then come back down. Generally, this is something that is used for emergency communications or where local comms is preferred. Moxon is not an acronym. It is named after the L Moxon rectangle, which is a horizontal rectangle antenna. There's other deployments of it, but that's um, that's common uh, common term. OCFD is an off-center fed dipole, which it's also called a Wyndham, which is named after Lauren or Loren Wyndham. Keep in mind that is an acronym and then also in the name of the creator of the thing. So, you know, Yagi Uda is not, or Yuda, is not an acronym. It is the name of the creators who came up with the antenna. So try to include Uda uh, when you do talk about Yagi's because he also deserves credit. I believe it's a he. Operating terms. All right. Terms used during radio operation. RST. You're going to see this on QSL cards, whether you're doing VHF simplex or you're doing HF radio, whatever it is, you're going to see it on QSL cards. It's going to say RST. Readability, signal strength, and tone. For single sideband, you're only really going to use the R and S, which is the readability and the signal strength. So when I say your 5.9 coming into Cerritos, California. I'm referring to your readability, which is a 1 out of 5 or 1 through 5, and then a signal strength, which is generally 1 through 9 or 0 really through 9. And then there are additions that you can add to 9. You are 10 over S9, 20 over S9. And radios usually help you out. The, the meter will show you how strong the signals are in coming in. The third, the T, refers to the tonal quality of the CW transmission, so RST. APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System. Proper acronym, it's referring to a mode based off of packet radio, which is called AX25. Packet radio, still kind of used uh, for TCP, right? TCP for Internet same kind of system that packetized data is packaged up <laughs> and transmitted over RF via your radio your handheld mobile radio you can also do it on HF but pre predominantly it's on VHF UHF now it, it it does use GPS right and a lot of people say oh no it's it's not it's not automatic position reporting system oh did I do it wrong I think it's packet 
I think it's packet. It is packet. I screwed that up. <laughs> I'm going to fix that right now because I don't want to mess that. <laughs> there is a bit of a, um, I'll explain. Yeah, so let me, let me explain what the difference is. It used to be referred to as automatic position reporting system, but it does way more than that. And I think people got the misnomer that that's all it does. It's packet. The, the mode at which the data is transmitted over RF is packetized data. That can include location information coming off of GPS um, signals or something you, you hand code into it. But it's for transmitting packet RF data. And already we mentioned earlier, somebody used APRS to send a RF packet message to what's called a digipeter, which ended up going to a converter that took, takes packet information and spits out SMS text messages with it. So it does more than position. And I should have corrected. I should have caught that. I don't know how I caught that. Anyway, sorry about that. ATV is amateur television. Uh, this is like fast scan television. It's the corollary to slow scan television, which we'll talk about. Oscar is orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio. I actually didn't know that until I looked that up not too long ago. RITTY, R-T-T-Y, is radio teletype. That's a mode of operation we use. SSTV is slow scan amateur television, which is what we use to send pictures over HF. Just a picture, just sends it. It could take minutes in some cases for a high quality picture to go over HF. There it is, a TNC, terminal node controller. This is amateur packet radio. I have a TNC in my home that I have connected to a VHF radio. TNCs are really cool. I did a video on that as well. It is, uh, again, packetized radio, used, used for packetized radio communication, and quite a fun thing. So deep dive that if you're interested. EME is Earth, Moon, Earth. It is literally when communication is facilitated by bouncing RF off of the moon. And as we say on the podcast, EME gets the ladies. All right. Operating terms continued. People will mention ARRL, ARRL. What does that stand for? The Amateur Radio Relay League. It's the American Association representing the interest of amateur radio operations. There are other leagues. I am America centric. I, I apologize. Feel free to drop in the chat, in the comments, what your favorite operating amateur league is for the country that you are in. MCOM stands for Emergency Communication. Kind of not an acronym more of an abbreviation. Aries is Amateur Radio Emergency Service. This is the MCOM group that was established by the ARRL. Nick Smith, thank you for the super chat. I won't be here for the end of the stream, so 7-3. Thank you for what you do. Hope the queen of all the land feels better soon. I do too. I'm, I, I hope she's, uh, I'll go catch up with her after the stream here, but hope she's uh, feeling better. Now, RACES, which is the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, is the MCOM group that was stood up by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Those two government organizations stood up an emergency system called RACES. Amateurs can join it, and uh, it, it's its own thing that is separate from ARIES. The IARU is the International Amateur Radio Union, and they are the overarching body that attempts to guide worldwide radio frequency use among countries. Operating terms continued. So these are all the fun events we like to do. SOTA, S-O-T-A, is summits on the air. POTA is parks on the air. IOTA is islands on the air. And WUMPLOTA is Walmart parking lots on the air. That one's unique. That one's specifically for making satellite contacts from a Walmart parking lot. They haven't done that in a while, but since I was going down all these ODAs, I thought I'd throw that one in there. And then WWFF is Worldwide Flora and Fauna. These are all terms you can look up uh, pretty much if you type those in on Google, you will get back, uh, get back what you're looking for. More terms. Now we're talking about more modes of operation. Whisper, as it's referred to, WSPR, is the weak signal propagation report. It is a beacon transmission mode that I use, other people use, to test how far their signals are getting out. Oh, <laughs> did I screw up the ARRL? Apologies. Uh, FD8 is the, the Frank Taylor Design 8 FSK modulation. 
That's digital mode that is uh, time synced transmissions for the exchange of contact information. So FT8 is used to quickly exchange uh, signal strength, time, and your location to put in your logs and make a QSO that way. Very effective down below the noise level. PSK31 is phase shift keying 31 baud rate. That is a digital mode similar to keyboard to keyboard, almost like a chat room. You type something up and you hit send and it goes out. Uh, and vice versa, you pick it up the other way. JSA call is the Jordan Shearer designed 8 FSK modulation that's built upon the FT8 framework, but it allows for more of a keyboard to keyboard loose conversation type mode and uh, asynchronous communication. Okay, Q codes. I think this is the last couple of slides here before we'll go to the chat. All right, not traditional acronyms. These are basically established codes that were used for Morse code transmissions. QRM, is there any man-made interference? And there is a distinction. QRM is man-made. QRN is atmospheric noise. QR Nancy versus QR Mary. QRO, shall I increase power? Meaning, should I bump up my power? Is it too low? Um, are you you're not able to copy me as well? QRP, shall I decrease power? Again, amateurs are really only supposed to use enough power to get our uh, communication across as efficiently as possible. So sometimes you want to drop the power. Sometimes you have no choice because you're using a low power radio. QRT, shall I stop sending? QRO, do you have any messages for me? And QRV, are you ready to receive? QRZ is who is calling me. So this is often most used when you are doing single sideband and you just wrapped up a contact, maybe it's a contest that you're in, and you say QRZ. So the stations that are listening already know you're transmitting on that frequency or you're doing a POTA or SOTA or whatever. Is uh, So you say QRZ and then the call sign's coming back in and you make another contact. Uh, QSL, can you acknowledge receipt? Yes, that is like a QSL card, right? That's an acknowledgement of your QSO. And Q oh, I don't have QSO. I thought that was right after. Okay, well, that's QSL is the byproduct of a, a QSL. <laughs> uh, QSP, can you relay a message? QSY is shall I change to another frequency? And QTH is your location. So let's flip that over right there. Sorry about that. So QTH is the location that you're transmitting from. There are a ton of Q codes. There are a ton of Q codes. So if you're curious in Q codes, if you're getting involved with CW, some of these are going to be effective uh, to know. I picked the ones that are uh, most likely to use. QSO, QSO is not as usable to me as QSL. That's probably why I skipped my mind, but... Uh, I am going to go back here, so I don't want to be... <laughs> We're going to fix that one right now. American. So nobody can say I screwed up. It's ARRL American Radio Relay League. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. So that's my acronyms and discussions for today. With that said, I'll, I'll play you out with some memes. Thanks again for watching. Do appreciate it. And 7-3.